Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'm really pleased to welcome you on behalf of the AIB to this panel discussion, Gender and Infrastructure in a Post-COVID World. The way women and men have access to and or access infrastructure is often different. And COVID has changed all our lives in one way or another, but it's more often than not had a disproportionate impact on the lives of women. So how should we be thinking about infrastructure now? What should the AIB be thinking about when it considers financing infrastructure so that it both improves the lives of men and women while at the same time addresses some of the impacts COVID has had on all of our societies? To help us address these questions, I'm joined by a, um, a panel comprised of old and new colleagues who are all experts in their fields. Dr. Elena Nikolova, Professor Yana Rogers, Samantha Hung, Eric Bergloff, Mr. Wensai Zhang, and Wei Min Zhou, who will share their thoughts, experience, ideas, and maybe offer us some advice. You can find their detailed profiles by clicking on the session information tab on your screen. I'm going to be speaking to each of the panel members, and then she'll open up for some Q&A in about 50 or minutes before returning to the discussion. So please, if you've got any questions, just pop them in the, in the, the Q&A box. So without much ado, let me start by speaking to Elena Nikolova, Associate Professor at Zaid University. Elena, you work with the AIB to, be, to help us understand where there were gender gaps in the water, public transport, roads, and highway sectors. So can you explain a little bit of what are gender gaps and why it's important to understand them? Thank you, Mikaela. So gender gaps in infrastructure, as you mentioned, um, can refer, you know, they're very broad, but more specifically, they can refer to any kinds of gender differences in access to or use of infrastructure. So an example is if a water pump is too heavy for women to use, but not for men, or if um, a bus is unsafe for women and that's why don't, they don't use it. And they're extremely important for everyone um, to understand because as we know, infrastructure is essential for all kinds of activities for women and for men, um, such as employment or accessing health services or any other kinds of services. So without understanding them, um, you know, we, we, cannot, we cannot understand these other activities, but um, also we cannot design policies and projects that close these gender gaps. So where did you find these gaps and what does it actually tell us? So the study that I authored um, for the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank looked at data uh, before COVID covering the period 2010, 2018. And the first takeaway of the study was that, well, gender gaps are everywhere. All right. So they're in every single country in, in uh, where um, AIB operates. Um, and moreover, one innovation of the study was that um, I looked at um, subnational gender gaps. So not at the level of the entire country, but the, at the level of subnational regions. And there was a lot of, um, you know, heterogeneity across regions. So in a, in, in a big country, we might have gender gaps, strong gender gaps in one region and a lower gender gaps in another region. So that's why it's extremely important, not just to look at the country level, but also at the more disaggregated subnational level. Well, that's, that's interesting, because you tend to think about countries as a one whole without differences. So what do you think the implications of this are for AIB, a, you know, a, a bank that finances infrastructure? I, I think there are imp very important implications of, of this research. Um, so in order to design um, effective, in, to have effective investments, to design effective projects, to, to spur change, we need to have um, data. And without data, we cannot um, really have effective projects. So, um, so, so these, so I, the, my hope is that, that this, the um, findings of this research will be used uh, by AIB to um, design effective projects that ultimately can change uh, and can, can change women's lives um, and ultimately close these gender gaps that were identified. Thank you, Elena. So let me turn to Jana Rogers now, who is professor in the School of Management and Labor Relations at Rutgers University. 
Welcome, Professor Rogers. Um, can you, can I, let me ask you, you edited and contributed to the special issue of the Journal of Feminist Economics on COVID-19. Can you maybe tell us what were the most important findings? Of course, well, there are lots of important findings. Um, but this uh, special issue of feminist economics, it, it covered the gendered dimensions of the COVID-19 pandemic and two findings, I believe, that are crucial for today's discussion uh, relate to gender differences in the impact on paid work and on unpaid work. So in terms of paid work, uh, we had a number of studies that documented and we also used ILO data in our introduction to document that women uh, were relatively more represented in those sectors with business shutdowns and closures. So employment losses tended to be larger for women than men in most countries that we looked at. Um, and the increase in unemployment was higher. And we also looked at the reasons for uh, the, the greater decline in employment for women. And not only was it for uh, reasons of losing their jobs due to business closures, but also more women pulled out of the labor force because they had to take care of children who were now at home because schools closed and daycare centers closed. In addition, more people were sick and needed care. Uh, we found that both men and women increased their unpaid workloads at home um, to take care of children and elderly and people were, who were sick, but those care loads increased more for women than they did for men. So that's interesting. And I, and I think we can all appreciate that women did, you know, lose their jobs and their economic opportunities, but how would that be relevant for infrastructure development? Okay, well, that's a key, uh, excellent question, and it's highly relevant, uh, especially uh, for the second main effect that we found in terms of the increase in care work done at home. Um, so we argue that policies that strengthen both the physical infrastructure as well as the social infrastructure have um, documented effects on reducing uh, time use in unpaid work, especially for women. And again, that time use increased more for women than men during the pandemic. And this in turn will lead to lower rates of time poverty. And uh, academics and uh, politicians are starting to talk more about time poverty and what we can do about that. So in terms of physical infrastructure, um, policies, especially in lower income countries, to reduce time spent on unpaid work would be uh, infrastructure that provides piped water, electrification, road construction, better transportation options, and sanitation services. And as Dr. Nikolova highlighted, it's crucially important to also make sure that women and men have equal access to that physical infrastructure. Um, these needs are especially stark in rural areas. Um, so the state of public infrastructure is one of the key determinants of unpaid labor and um, the ease of accessing drinking water and firewood in particular. Uh, one study that um, I looked at showed that in the Philippines and several other low-income uh, countries that an improved water source, women having access to an improved water source, could reduce their unpaid care workloads by one to four hours per day. Um, another argument is that improving um, access to information, communication, and technology services, or ICT, could also help to improve um, uh, women's time use by reducing it and reducing time poverty, uh, largely through an increase in their employment and income, which could improve their bargaining power in the home, so to speak, so they could actually bargain for a more equitable distribution of care work in the home. Um, but again, any kind of policy that boosts um, employment uh, won't 
be as effective unless we also strengthen the care infrastructure through the provision of affordable care services. So uh, priorities for strengthening uh, the care infrastructure uh, would especially highlight more spending on education and health care uh, with an emphasis on providing universal access to free or affordable child care and elder care. And that also could help to create new jobs for paid care workers and teachers who are predominantly women. And again, we found that more women than men lost their jobs during the pandemic. So investing in health and education can grow employment in ways that reduce unpaid work burdens, meet basic service needs, and reallocate women's time from unpaid work to paid work. Thank you. And I think we can all, the ICT, I think, was global. Everybody realized that their internet connections weren't good enough to manage schoolwork and work work. So I think that was probably a global issue. Thank you very yeah, much, Yana. Yeah, thank you. Um, Eric, you're the chief economist at the AIB, having been the chief previously been the chief economist at the EBRD. So can you maybe explain the rationale for the development of an inclusive infrastructure, please? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this conversation. I think it's all been the case that already been made. You know, we, we are constructing infrastructure because we want it to be used. And, and if, you know, large parts of the population, you know, women, you know, uh, minority group, uh, handicapped people cannot access this infrastructure. It's worthless and, and we don't get the, the, um, the economic value out of infrastructure. But I think it's, there's a more important point is that the economic value also comes from unleashing the productive potential of different parts of society. And, and if large parts of society are excluded because they don't dare to use full, at least fully this infrastructure, maybe at night and so on, that is a major loss to society and, and all these opportunities that uh, we are hoping that the infrastructure should generate are not given. Thank you. Could you maybe elaborate a little bit on why it makes, we, we've, we've made the case for infrastructure having important social, social outcomes, but what, can you maybe elaborate a little bit why you also think it makes good economic and financial sense to do this? I think, again, it's, it's pretty straightforward. The, we, we talk about something we call equality of opportunity. And this is, obviously, we care both about the quality of outcomes, but equality of opportunity is, is very straightforward in this case because, you know, equality of opportunity is about making sure that things that you cannot control yourself, like, you know, who, what gender you have, what, you know, who are your parents, where you were you born and so on. All those things, we don't want them to influence um, economic outcomes. And it, Equality opportunity is, is about making sure that in all these dimensions, we use the full potential of, of society to produce and, and, and contribute. And, and that's where the, equality, the, um, the infrastructure becomes so important because that's both because the, the, it allows women to participate, but it also enhances the value of women's participation in the economy. So there, there are a lot of, of very strong economic and, and financial arguments for um, including uh, and making sure that women are fully included. And by the way, I, I think we should also take into account that you know, to, to really make this work, it has to be inclusive also in, in the process of, of building this infrastructure, because that's where you know, we, we become aware of these uh, issues that may be there. And, and by including the population, uh, the people who are supposed to use this infrastructure, you know, that's uh, critical to making sure that this infrastructure is truly inclusive. So both in the process of planning and implementing, and then finally using uh, infrastructure, we need to be inclusive. And, and the, the economic rationale is very straightforward. And, and it, we have seen many examples of this. I, I, I used to, uh, an example that I, I thought was, um, for me, very impactful. Um, when I was at the EB, EBRD, we financed sometimes um, shopping malls, and shopping malls, you know, for a development economist, has, you know, 
we do not always very excited. We know that they are very good for productivity reasons, but they of course have a, you know, other impacts that may, may not always be uh, very um, supportive of, and, and they also uh, probably don't often need development uh, bank funding. But in one example that I came across that was very striking to me was a, in a shopping mall, I think, Michaela, you remember this case, <laughs> the shopping mall in Amman, in Jordan. And, and uh, you think, what can be the sort of, um, inclusion impact of a project like that? Well, what, what they managed to do was to build basically an academy for women who worked inside this shopping mall. And they allowed them to, to develop over time, build their skills, create a record that they could use both for their career within this sort of shopping mall, but also more generally outside in in uh, in, uh, in society, and and I think it's by creating this opportunity, using infrastructure to also when you construct infrastructure, making sure that women are included in that process of, of building and 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 so on. So I think there are many many uh, ways in which we can be much more creative and more open-minded in terms of how we promote inclusion. And I think you may also remember the example, Eric, of uh, projects we both worked on on transport. And if you don't ask women and men what they want from the transport, you know, and mm. what why they don't use it now, yes. and by making it the design um, more accessible, maybe for women with prams or whatever, you also enable people with disabilities to use it. Mm. Isn't that right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And as I said, the, the what is critical is that we include those who are the users, the future users in, in the planning process, in the implementation. And, and, and I think that's where the development banks have, have a, a huge responsibility to make sure that this, this happens because it's, you know, it's understandable. Many countries are building infrastructure under great pressure, both financially and, and, and in terms of other things that they have to address. And not the least in this pandemic now, there are so many things that are distracting for, for policymakers, but making sure that when we are actually involved in these projects, we really take this seriously. Thank you, Eric. Um, let me turn now to Samantha Hung. Uh, hi, Samantha. So Samantha is the Chief of Gender Equality at the Asian Development Bank, or ADB. Um, and Samantha, the... Gender equality has been so central to the work of ADB for decades now. Can you maybe explain why? Sure, Michaela, thank you. And first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to join this interesting panel. I think the quick answer would be that ADB has come on a very, very long journey. Um, you know, the first the role of what was called Women in Development was adopted way back in 1985. And at that time, the approach was to implement a range of activities that emphasize women, I guess, as vulnerable target group. So, you know, we've come sort of long, you know, fast forward a couple of decades where we really um, moved to a gender development approach. And that was really, I guess, it reflected the state of pay, play in gender development discourse globally at that time. But it was really in um, 1998 when we adopted our gender and development policy, which still exists. Uh, that a gender mainstreaming approach was given formal recognition. And that by that, I meant that the policy meant that considerations of gender would be mainstreamed in all ADB activities, including projects, sector work, macroeconomic analysis, and technical assistance work. So I guess that was the, the awakening, if you like, that gender and a gender mainstreaming approach lends to better project design and better development results, and ultimately, impact for the people we are trying to serve and therefore it enabled us to better deliver against our mandate. But I guess if you if you think about our current time, why it is so important is that it has since become a priority area in our, at the highest level in our corporate strategy. And the real game changer was that it institutionalized accountability through setting of targets, corporate targets for uh, gender mainstream operations, which we have to report on annually. And underpinning that is, I guess, um, a, a very sort of institutional mechanism, and that is our gender mainstreaming categorization system, 
where basically all projects, sovereign and private sector, are measured against the four-tier um, general system at entry. And we're proud to say that it's actually considered a MDB good practice. So we've updated these guidelines in the past year, and they're really used across the board um, to measure, count, and report on the extent to which gender equality issues are integrated into all ADB project designs. Thanks. So that's very interesting from the institutional perspective. So can you maybe explain what's actually been achieved on the ground um, over the last 20 years, maybe with some project examples or um, you know, how you put this, what it means for sure. men and women in the countries where you work? Sure. So what it means is because we have an institutional system in place, that there is a very in, intentional um, gender design or incorporated into, um, into all the projects. So I mentioned before that we have um, targets. So our current targets are, are that 75% of all our portfolio will uh, directly support uh, gender inclusive designs and 55% of them will be gender mainstreamed. And at the other end, we also have a target which requires us to measure the extent to which we deliver against those in terms of results at completion. So what that means in practice is that um, at concept stage, we are reviewing all projects across all sectors. And when we're talking about infrastructure sectors, I remember when I first joined ADB over 12 years ago, we were really just starting to learn how to do it well in the infrastructure sector. And we had our first um, a, uh, transport sector projects at the time that actually were achieving what we call gender mainstreaming. Now we've got about 72% of our urban and water, 67% of the transport and 54 in the energy has as um, gender mainstreamed. Maybe one example is if I, we talk about the energy sector, which is quite um, interesting because we recently approved our new ADB energy policy and we were able to mainstream um, gender language into that. And so that means that in practice, through our project designs, we would be looking at things such as how are we supporting, um, well, how are we consulting women and men um, equally in the design? How are we supporting job creation for women, particularly um, green jobs for women, um, given the growth of renewable energy focus? How are we um, the necessary training in STEM to be able, enable them to be able to access those jobs? And at the same time, I mean, Jana talked about um, unpaid care, uh, very relevant in this um, current time, but we also deliberately look at to what extent through the infrastructure we are actually um, helping women's time poverty in terms of vision of last mile access, um, what access to uh, clean cooking facilities and heating means for women's lives. So those are some examples of what, what it looks like on the ground. And so in this, you know, while, you know, AIB is a much younger organization and we're thinking about how we can do, and especially, you know, the case has been made why we need to really think about this in this post or COVID world. We're not quite in the post stage yet, unfortunately. Um, what lessons do you, should we, do you think we, you would, we should learn from you? Um, that's a very big question. Uh, thank you for okay, that. Okay, well. <laughs> but um, I think... I think I would boil it down to maybe three things if I had to. Um, and the first is you need to really build the start steadily and build the capacity, skills and tools for it. And I think that it's important that people working um, in the infrastructure sector, for example, that they understand that it's that their work is not gender neutral and they have to actually deliberately do something to to really um, serve um, people equally. That requires a bit of training, it, it requires support so that they understand and, and sort of own the issue that it's not just about um, not doing harm, um, but that actually if they, if they take a gender blind approach, they're missing opportunity to do all these additional things um, that can, can improve women's mobility, their safety, um, their unpaid care, et cetera. So I think that's a mind shift thing. And, and a provision of tools and training is, is part of that. And that's something we've been doing for some years. I think the second area is I think that you need to, as an organization, recognize and support internal gender champions um, at all levels, uh, because it's important to give the, the work credibility and to keep it on the agenda in the organization. And, um, and, and I guess part of that is also having people whose job that is. So that's the second. I think the third one would be 
resourcing. Um, and by that, I mean uh, res human resourcing. I mean, we, we've grown from one gender specialist way back to now we have 26 core gender staff positions at international and national level, um, both in headquarters and, and resident missions. So that's important. But it's also having the resources to do the work. So um, part of that is, is for us is that during um, project preparation, there needs to be enough resources for proper gender analysis. Um, for gender designs that are incorporated, you need to have budgeting um, to enable them to be implemented. And those are actually um, requirements for us. Um, and they become part of the learning activities, as well as sometimes additional TA and grants to go with it. So those are some thoughts. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, I'd now like to turn to Mr. Wensley Jang. Yes. Hello. Uh, good yes. evening, Mr. Jang. Um, yes. Mr. Jang is the Vice President of the Agricultural Development Bank of China which lends only in rural areas. Um, could you share with us some of the examples of the, of the projects of the ADBC and why and how these particularly benefit women? Thank you, uh, uh, Michelle. First of all, let me say that I'm very pleased to join you for, for this very important uh, discussion. As you all know that uh, the Agricultural Development Bank of China or uh, uh, was founded in the 1994, and uh, uh, the bank is the only agriculture-focused uh, uh, policy bank in China. Uh, with a close to the sovereign uh, credit rating, we raised the funds in the market to support projects related to the agriculture rural areas and farmers in China. Actually, we, we have projects in, in rural areas, but also we do have also some projects in the city, uh, which you know uh, have, have uh, uh, agriculture elements. Who is focused on agriculture? So also, you know, uh, we are not just uh, lending uh, in a, in a, uh, in a, in a rural area. As China had successfully eradicated extreme rural poverty by the end of 2020 last year. Uh, ADBC has uh, uh, prominently shifted uh, its focus in the next five years uh, to safeguarding a national food security, uh, consolidating and expanding achievement of poverty alleviation. Its effort to promote rural revitalization and accelerating agricultural modernization, advancing agriculture and rural construction, facilitating coordinated development between regions and enhancing ecological uh, civilization construction. For years, we have been uh, committed to uh, showing up infrastructure weak links by supporting new urbanization, improving the rural living environment, in ecological pollution treatment, uh, shanty town renovation, and road network developing the rural areas, so end of the September uh, this year, in terms of the outstanding loan size, infrastructure was our largest business area with over 3.9 trillion RMB of outstanding loan, accounting for about 60% of ADBC's total outstanding loan of 6.6 .6 trillion uh, RMB. Uh, as a policy bank, ADBC aligns our operation with UN uh, 2030, SDG goals and their shared development uh, philosophy of Chinese government and benefit women with concrete results. Recent years has seen ADBC prioritizing infrastructure projects to drive rural environmental improvement, connectivity, and digital empowerment, which guarantees women's participation and that women are able to share in the benefits of those projects. I will give you some example here. So the first case. Our Hunan, you know the Hunan province, our Hunan branch funded a project to uh, clean the, the black and the malodorous water bodies in the, in the Anhua county, improving women's living and working conditions. The branch worked with the county government to issue uh, 1.35 billion RMB alone to the Anhua water quality improvement company that carry on both the cleaning up the water bodies and the construction of sewage treatment facilities. Uh, 500,000 rural residents, half of them are women uh, from the 264 villages will benefit. During the construction, project active efforts were made to hire local workers, especially poverty striking women. And additional uh, 50,000 RMB was added to per capita annual income among the local poor. After projects completed, uh, the local living conditions are expected to improve uh, significantly as women will have a much 
better access to clean water and pleasant uh, outdoor spaces near their homes. And improve the ecological uh, conditions will be uh, conducive to developing tea planting and tea, uh, same the tourism, significantly boosting the opportunity for women to start their own business and find jobs. The second case, uh, the Hunan branch also find finance the ferry to bridge project in the in the in the, in the Xinhua County to have women better connect with the outside world. The Hunan branch supported the upgrade of the transportation system in the Xinhua County to boost the development of the, uh, with the better connectivity, helping women venture beyond the mountains and embrace the greater possibility. Surrounded by the hills, Xinhua uh, uh, County's uh, territories are divided into two halves by the Zijiang River. Uh, two existing bridges are updated. The ferry terminal are far from enough to meet uh, across river traffic demand. Having determined to build a bridge uh, in a place of ferry terminal, the county government applied for a 220 million RMB, uh, a 15-year loan from the from the bank. As of the end of 2020 last year, we had to issue a 150 million RMB loan in loans to the project that generated considerable social economic benefits for the women. For instance, many project-related jobs were open to local poor women, boosting their income and uh, employment opportunity. When the bridge is built, it will replicate the ferry services that are easily uh, uh, success acceptable to the weather impacts, visibly enhancing traffic condition for the uh, 710,000 local women, especially the 80,000 living in the, in the poverty, who, who will find it increasingly convenient to, to look beyond the, the hills for the better job uh, prospect. Uh, uh, third, uh, uh, third case, ADBC has also developed the digital infrastructure to support the micro and small businesses. To address the challenges of, of uh, assessing finance, cheap finance in particular, uh, facing the micro and small businesses. ADBC launched its own online loan services center for micro and small businesses two years ago, which types China's advantage in mo mobile internet, big data, AI, internet of things, cloud uh, computing, and the payment. The center relies on the convenient e-payment system that automatically offers small loan in a timely, efficient, uh, and seven day, 24 hour day manner. Our two years operation, the, the, the total of 49 point 32 billion RMB in small loans uh, has been issued to nearly 21,000 micro and small business owners. To counter the, the worst impact of COVID-19, the center also issued COVID fighting loan of 457 million RMB to 643 uh, businesses to help them uh, stabilize the operations and retain a feasible, uh, female workers. So, colleagues, those are the three cases I just want to, to share with you on how we uh, involve women, how we uh, support women's uh, participation in the infrastructure, uh, in the rural area, in the agricultural sector. Thank you. Thank you. That's very interesting. Clearly, you've devoted a lot of resources to thinking about um, making an impact on the lives of women in rural areas. I'd like to turn now to my colleague, Wei Min Zhou. Um, Wei Min, hi. Uh, hi. Can you maybe tell us about a project that you've worked on as a project team leader that had a gender component in its design and explain a little bit, please? Um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, very important uh, discussion. Uh, one good example I can think of uh, is the Mumbai uh, Urban Transport Project, Phase 3. Uh, this project is to improve the capacity, safety, and ultimately the level of service of Mumbai suburban rail system uh, by expanding the suburban rail corridors and the building uh, flyover bridges for uh, pedestrians and the passengers. Uh, this project uh, will also improve 14 existing stations uh, which gave us the opportunity to include the gender consideration into the improvement. Uh, I just want to have a very short introduction on uh, this Mumbai suburban rail system because this system is also called as a local train. It's probably one of the busiest uh, train system in the world uh, with total 114 stations welcoming 8 million trips every day. Uh, actually, 
one fourth, 23% of the passengers are women. It is really the lifeline of the city because uh, almost half of the trips uh, conducted in Mumbai actually by this system. Uh, the Mumbai suburban rail uh, face many, uh, many challenges, especially overcrowding during the peak hours and the safety issues. Um, actually, this system already has some gender measures, such as uh, ladies only in coach, uh, helpline to report any danger or harassment, uh, better lightings at the platforms, etc. However, actually during the uh, project preparation stage, a gender survey was conducted in uh, 2019 by interviewing about 1,000 female passengers uh, to understand their uh, satisfaction level on the overall travel experiences and also on the facilities and the infrastructure. Based on that survey, about 45% of the female passengers are not satisfied with the overall experience, which means uh, although they have some measures, uh, but still big rooms to improve. These concerns mainly include the concerns on the security and the lack of uh, gender-related facilities. So the comments and the suggestions from that survey were shared with the station uh, improvement design consultants to include uh, gender features, gender design in this design. Uh, for example, uh, you know, better visual distance in the station halls, uh, better lighting, especially on the corners and the flyover uh, pedestrian bridges to avoid any dark spots, uh, installation of CCTVs, uh, awareness of the existing helpline, uh, ladies' waiting areas, uh, cleaning washrooms, uh, baby feeding rooms, elevators with a glass door, uh, etc. Also, the panic button at the flyover bridges um, and the signage system for the ladies' uh, facility. Uh, if you notice, actually, these are very small changes and the small things which uh, could be quickly implemented to have uh, very positive impacts. Uh, currently, this project is still under implementation. Uh, we are very forward to seeing the good results from this project after uh, it, the completion. Um, based on our uh, you know, result indicator, it is expected uh, that female passengers' satisfaction level will be improved to 80% with this upgraded uh, facilities. Thank you, Wayman. And can I ask you, I mean, it's not, as a project team leader, what, what were the lessons that you learned in thinking about? Well, these, actually these, a these, lot of... <laughs> Maybe you. some personal reflections, I don't know. <laughs> uh, very interesting question. Actually, uh, quite uh, many lessons learned. Uh, first of all, I think most importantly is about the support. This is about the support and the buy-in from the client. Uh, because, you know, during the project preparation, the project team had quite intensive discussion with the client and identified that we still have that gender gap. The gender design and the gender informed infrastructure definitely can help, can improve the level of service of this system. And uh, through a lot of discussions, uh, the client was very supportive on this idea so that the gender survey and the gender informed the design could be conducted smoothly. Um, I think second of all, it's about this uh, uh, meaningful survey and the consultation with female passengers. Um, because as uh, other panelists said that uh, understanding the users are very, very important. Um, Actually, during the project preparation, at the very beginning, we you know, regularly have this kind of uh, public consultation uh, based on the requirements from the ENS, Environmental and Social Impact Analysis, right? But the team believed that more detailed and in-depth survey actually were needed to understand the specific needs of female passengers. So additional gender survey was conducted um, so it really get really good uh, insights and the results. Uh, I think another one I would mention is how to ensure 
these female uh, passengers to aware and use these facilities. Because, uh, um, you know, for example, the uh, existing, you know, helpline uh, for the female passengers to report any res uh, harassment or safety issues uh, is there, it's already there. However, based on the survey, 78% of the female passengers did not know about it. So after the completion of this project, we'd like to have a, a public awareness campaign so that these facilities could be used more efficiently in the future. I think those are the uh, top lessons uh, uh, from, the from the project team. Thank you. Thank you, Weimin. So I think it, you know we've talked about the it, both the economic and financial and social out importance of infrastructure that takes gender into consideration, the need to actually consult with users, and um, also the importance of actually infrastructure in in this the, the need for infrastructure, the importance of it in this our uh, COVID post COVID world. So I've got a. I'd like to switch to now some uh, questions and you know Q and A. And I have one question which is I think quite relevant to the discussion. It says, "What is the most immediate or most important uh, infrastructure that we should be thinking about now to address the COVID nineteen impacts on women?" So if I may, could I go to ya Professor Yana Rogers first, please? Yeah. Um, I would say that that would be investment in social infrastructure. And I looked yesterday at the AIB website and just looked for um, articles and news releases and discussion of social infrastructure. And I know that the AIB is talking about social infrastructure and starting to invest in that. And especially in light of the pandemic and the needs to support care work um, I would say it's crucial to think more creatively and spending more money on social infrastructure, especially in the healthcare sector and in the education sector. Thank you. Elena. Michaela, that's a, that's a very broad question. Uh, so I would say that it would really depend on the circumstances. I mean, if we have a country that is, uh, and again, I'm thinking about the country, but we really need to think at, at a level lower than the country. So if we have a country um, that is a lower income country um, and, um, you know, um, women are struggling to get jobs or women are in, in lower paid jobs, I would I would think that infrastructure such as roads and highways to potentially connect them to, um, you know, uh, employment opportunities or buses, things like that would be important. But on the other hand, if we have a situation where we have um, a country or a region that is advanced, um, particularly in the in the post-COVID world, we really need digital infrastructure. So we need, you know, internet, we, know, we need reliable internet and we need uh, reliable computers and, and, and things like that. So I would say that it, it would really depend on the circumstances and it would be extremely important to understand them and how women fit into those particular circumstances of, of the location and what are their needs and, and wants and tailor the infrastructure investment appropriately. Eric, can I ask you for, I'm sure you know, you've been discussing this about, you know, and thinking about this, this subject. What do you think of it would be the primary or the most important, I should say, infrastructure that we sh that we should be considering in now well, I, I would very much second the comment about social infrastructure and and uh, of course that's mostly new to us we we have just we created our social infrastructure department uh, just a few months ago or, or a, a, now it's almost a year ago and and um, we have focused on health so far and and uh, that I think is where the most immediate lessons from the um, the pandemic are. That that's where the busy, very much really basic healthcare didn't work, and and particularly I think that affected women. And of course, women were also the most those who who were most uh, involved in in um, helping to to uh, 
rescue lives in, in the pandemic and, and they so a lot of things need to be learned from from that experience how can we um, provide better uh, protection better opportunities for for women in in, in you know when we have these um, pandemics because we will have more of them and, and we need to to think as as development institutions how can we prepare society better uh, well, how can we also make society more resilient to these kind of, of um, events and and part of that is is definitely uh, inf investments in basic in, in basic healthcare but there are, there are many other elements too and we talked about education and education opportunities we have we haven't really seriously started on on uh, making uh, big investments in education it's, it's something that will have to come um, in, in the longer term but it, it's certainly an area that we are very much aware of particularly maybe vocational training where where there are also a lot of opportunities to try to target uh, target women I, I think one thing that came out of you know the earlier discussion we had is that we, we, we must get away from thinking about this as sort of minimizing negative impact. We need to think of these projects as, as really actively promoting um, the case for women or whether there are other groups in society that needs to, to be approached in, in, in a more inclusive way. So, so it's, it's really looking at the upside of what, what the infrastructure can do to help women uh, take full part in society. I know at, at the EBRD when we were faced with, uh, we were asked to go into North Africa and the Middle East, it hadn't really been an issue before to think so much about the gender dimension. But when you realize that 80% of women are outside the official labor force, that really opens your eyes to the role that you can have in, in, in mobilizing women and, and bringing them into the, the you know, providing the full potential of their, their um, there are capacities that we can we we need to think in a much more active way about how we how we can use our various tools to to bring people into the full contribution to the economy thanks eric mm -hmm. samantha maybe could you what do, what has the adb been doing what do they think of their priority infrastructure areas now in this time Thanks very much, Michaela. I mean, I guess that there's two questions. I mean, ADB traditionally, uh, transport and um, energy have the, been the biggest of our pie. But, you know, we do also invest in social sectors. Um, we've always been a player in education and in health, um, water and sanitation to different levels. But I mean, I think just going back to what some of the other panelists I said, I think I, I agree with all um, the different elements of what each have said. I mean, to, to that that's really important. I think if anything, the whole COVID pandemic has really put a spotlight on some of the gender issues that were already there. And I think the unpaid um, and the care economy is a critical one. So I think from ADB's perspective, we are um, looking at that. We're doing some research at the moment, looking at regional research with ILO, um, UNDP and UN UNRWA is actually looking at childcare specifically, regionally and a few in-depth country studies to really look at what are um, potential gaps to address childcare holistically and what potential investment opportunities there may be to support um, better provision of childcare in, uh, in our developing member countries. So that's one. I think again, uh, to I think Elena's point, it, it really does depend on the context. So in, and, and also related to the uncare burden, in some instances, provision of good water and sanitation can make a huge impact on women's um, care work and, and their time. So I think that's still really relevant. Um, and just on the digital point, I think um, I think I do agree with that too, but it has to be done in a gender responsive way. I mean, we've learned through the COVID pandemic, the reliance on digital infrastructure and how patchy that is. But we also know that there's a huge digital gender divide. Um, and that relates back to getting girls back into school. I mean, you know, digital uh, delivery of education, it doesn't mean a lot for a lot of girls. Um, you know, there's a real difference in access to mobile phone coverage. Um, and we all know that the, with the growth of online um, e-commerce that's supposedly grown a lot through um, COVID, it actually has been much more difficult for women entrepreneurs to be able to access those opportunities. So I think we need to think about digital infrastructure in a very deliberate way to make sure that we make it inclusive um, and that it actually benefits women well as well.
Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've had a question about how, when we're co-financing, we can, AIB can successfully influence, or I suppose ADB can successfully influence um, the design of a project. Wei Min, can you, with your experience of co-financing, how does that work? I think uh, uh, co-financing is definitely a very good way uh, we can all, and also we can uh, show our advantage uh, 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 to support the client uh, in a collective way um, because uh, actually we have uh, quite many uh, you know co-financing projects with ADB and uh, uh, the World Bank and uh, actually we are increasing the financing support to the client country. Uh, at, at the same time, uh, actually the monitoring and the preparation of those projects, actually the resources can be limited in a way. Um, other than that, uh, may I respond to the previous question? I think I have something to add uh, if uh, that's okay. Yes, yeah, sure, of course. Thank you. Um, because I have a urban transport background, um, most important infrastructure um, after uh, COVID world, I would say it's about the public transport and the walking environment. I mean, the sidewalks, because, uh, you know, those are the transport modes actually women uh, prefer based on the, uh, uh, some, uh, you know, uh, survey we had, actually this uh, walking and the public transport uh, women uh, taking more of them, uh, uh, much more than, than, than men. So that's one thing. The second thing is, however, during the pandemic, actually, we can see, um, you know, the public transport, the passengers getting less because uh, uh, people are afraid of uh, being infected in a way, being uh, inside this public transport tools. Um, so we, we think, I, I think it's very important that after the pandemic, we need to get the passengers back and uh, to create better environment for them, uh, considering the uh, health uh, risks in a way. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, some people said that actually public transport can uh, increase the infection uh, risks. However, some of the uh, service is not the case because it's not about public transport. Actually, it's about uh, cloudiness in a way. So um, in the future, actually, we need to invest more on the public transport because it's green and uh, is, um, you know, accessible for all. And at the same time, um, you know, it is uh, very important for the female passengers to use. Uh, and uh, also we need to emphasize on the safety uh, and, uh, you know, health uh, considerations to make it more uh, healthy in a way. Thank you. Thank you, Weimin. Um, We've had a question asking, actually, you know, how there's often where there is, there's an increase in the incidence of gender-based violence when there's, um, you know, investments in infrastructure. And, you know, what, what do we and what do others, what should we be doing about it? Now, of course, the AIB has a uh, revised environmental and social framework and now consideration of the risks of gender-based violence um, is to be taken into consideration when we're looking at the project and um, how we're going to design it. Um, I was wondering whether, Sam, you could talk a little bit about also what the ADB is doing? Thank you, Michaela. Yes, yeah, so I, I like AIB. I mean, that forms part of our sort of fundamental gender analysis at, at outset and, and which assesses to the extent to which there are there are risks. So I guess it, for us, um, the, the assessment of risk, it goes into our safeguards, where, which is like a do no harm. So we assess it at that level, but then sort of proactive measures to actually uh, address um, gender designs in a proactive way sort of fits under the gender policy. So that's sort of the division of, of labor. But yes, it is something that's on our minds. And we are at, at this um, stage actually developing a good practice note to actually um, address this in a more sort of conscious way going forward in terms of how we actually take a risk-based approach to addressing and mitigating and responding to a sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment that may occur in infrastructure projects. 
Thanks, Sam. We've had a question here. It says, given the importance of unpaid care work provided by women, should MDVs also be focusing more on part-time work, daycare, which you also alluded to a little bit before, Sam, um, and um, to increase uh, women's participation in the labor force? Um, Jana, would you like to take that first? Yes, I think this question raises uh, the crucial point that unpaid care work is a constraint on women's ability to participate in the labor force. And um, Eric had mentioned that in his comments too. So investing in um, you know, social infrastructure, especially in um, ways that minimize care work of um, children and elderly will help to alleviate some of the constraints on women's labor force participation. And I think overall, these kind of investments, you know, they, they're win-win. They uh, not only um, reduce unpaid work, but they also promote employment, you know, new jobs, uh, which are predominantly held by women in healthcare, in childcare, in education. So I do believe it's a win-win situation. And I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that's, that's, thank you very much. And I have a question actually directed to you, Samantha, particularly, but I think maybe Eric can also tackle it. It's about, you know, um, this does invest project financing have its limitations? Um, what, what, what does, can policy lending do? How, how can that help? So in terms of modality, our system applies to all types of modalities. So um, whether it be policy-based loans, results-based loans, sector programs and the like, um, it, is, it is harder, to be honest, in a policy-based loan because of the, the criteria that we apply and we, and we into actually it requires much more upfront um, policy dialogue and engagement and I guess for, for our system requirements that we have actually specific policy-based provisions that actually um, have gender, um, gender, gender policy changes rather in them. But we have actually had some success in recent years. Um, and uh, we had a, a successful um, policy-based loan in the financial sector in Indonesia, which was categorized as gender equity theme. And we had one also in, in Fiji, which a management, public sector management kind of a policy-based loan. And so they were quite exciting. The Fiji one actually introduced gender budgeting systems uh, into um, the government budgeting system. And the Indonesia one included things such as um, helping the government to develop a, the first national financial inclusion strategy for women. Um, and so it's doable, but it really requires, I would say, um, a, a bit more effort. And you really need a project leader that really is prepared to take this on and have that conversation all the time, right from the beginning, um, but it's possible. And it's, it's, I think a lot, a lot of impact can be made through such modalities. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Actually, we're sort of nearing the end of our session, but I would like to ask each of you, the panelists, to think, give us some brief words of advice or what you think should be our focus for developing the approach to financing uh, infrastructure to address some of the impacts that we've seen um, from COVID and how it's exacerbated inequalities. And so, you know, what should be AIB's priorities and focus? So I'm going to start with Elena, please. Thank you, Mikael. So uh, for me, I always repeat this. Uh, so for those of you that you know me, I'm, I'm sorry if you hear this over and over again, but I, I think we really need to collect data. We really need to collect data at the micro level. We really need to collect data at the macro level. And uh, for AIB in particular, uh, we really need to collect data at the project level. And I was very happy to uh, when I was listening to Wayman because he was saying that there was a survey done among women um for the for the mumbai metro project so we need more of these things we need a survey before the project and we need a survey after the project we need focus groups with women we need these kinds of reliable data so that um you know 
decisions can be made based on robust evidence. Um, and uh, Eric also mentioned that we should not only think about gender, but other dimensions, you know, um, intersectionality of identities. Uh, so we, we need to collect data on how disabled people, for example, use uh, infrastructure on their satisfaction. Um, and so AIB can do this at the project level, but I think there should be a global effort to run more of these surveys and, and other tools to collect data, because without data, we cannot really design appropriate policies and we cannot really design um, appropriate projects and we cannot really um, you know, um, empower women um, globally. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Jana, could I ask you, please? Um, yes, I love uh, Elena's response and would um, add to that, uh, not only to collect the data, but also to make that data available for researchers to use. There just aren't that many studies and we need more studies uh, measuring and quantifying what is the impact of infrastructure investment on gendered outcomes. It's surprising how little available um, evidence there is in terms of studies that we can read. So yes, definitely data as well as making that data available for reports and studies that we can get the evidence. And I just want to, you know, again, reinforce my point and I'm i um, happy to hear that Eric uh, mentioned that AIEB now has uh, a new department on social infrastructure, and it's crucially important to invest both in physical as well as social infrastructure um, to alleviate women's time constraints at home, but also to create new job opportunities, especially in healthcare as well as education. Thank you, Jana. And Samantha? Michaela, I, I agree with what all others have said, but I guess from a, a more sort of systems perspective, I would I would suggest that, you know, you you have to sort of, you know, we've come a long way in the journey. So you sort of have to start that journey and uh, to where you're at as an institution. But I think a big step would be to um, to have some kind of policy position which which makes this uh, gen whole area of supporting gender, particularly in a post COVID context, um, integral to all infrastructure projects at some level. Um, and I think maybe some some way to pilot demonstration effect. I mean, I think Wayman's example was great, but I, I, and I, I think if you had some way to sort of pilot that straight, that's the best way to learn um, from the peers to see what's worked and have build up that sort of um, internal sort of a resource of good practice. That would be my take on it. Thank you. And Wen Tsai, what would be your advice okay thank and you what do you think to be our priority what should be the priority focus a couple of points i want to make uh, i think maybe uh, aib can consider uh, first i think like colleagues said already uh, we should give more attention to the design of infrastructure uh, uh, and particularly at the design stage we should really consider how the project uh, contribute to the gender uh, mainstream gender elements gender equity uh, I remember when I was in ADB as a vice president, I think my colleague know that. So I, I pushed my team to really to think about it. You know, otherwise, uh, you know, we may not uh, think uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, a project with good uh, enough attention to the gender, you know, issue. So I think uh, without a good design at the very beginning, the project itself may not, uh, we don't, we may not have uh, seen the, the, the gender, uh, you know, uh, equity automatically at the end. So. Secondly, we think we should balance the support to both the physical and the social infrastructure. Colleagues already mentioned about that, particularly as we fight against the COVID-19. Uh, I think the education sector, vocational education, public health, particularly public health, right, are, are playing a very important role. And certainly, women can also benefit from development of those social infrastructure. I think this is also a very important one. Third point I want to make is that uh, traditionally we focus on the transport, energy, you know, water supply. Those are very still very important, you know, for both city and the rural area. But now we should give more attention to develop the new infrastructure. Like in China, we are called the new kind of infrastructure for like a digital infrastructure, you know, represented by the five. 5G network, internet things, big data, AI, and other things, right? So I think we, uh, as we see uh, during the, the last year, this year, the e-commerce really, uh, you know, play a very important role for, for, the, for the economic recovery. 
And you know, so people can use, use the e-commerce, right, to, to sell the product even from a rural area to the city. So I can see that digital infrastructure is so important. Now I think, uh, I, I think we should do more. And last but not least, support also need to be direct to the productive sectors upon which more public activity can, can help the women, right, to, to get jobs and to, to get more benefits. I, I think you build infrastructure, but at the same time, you also need to, to develop the, the productive sectors. You know, AIB is, uh, you know, focusing on the inf infrastructure, right? But, but also, you, we need to think how we can develop the uh, productive, other productive sectors, so people can get a job, particularly for women. So I think this is something, you know, we, we need to think about. So those are the five points I want to make. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Wei Min, could, um, do, you have, do you see in the short term some more opportunities to prepare projects with, with gender taken into consideration? Definitely. I, I think uh, that's a definitely yes, uh, especially in the transport uh, projects. Because traditionally, uh, for example, uh, the PTLs and uh, 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 project teams, we are, you know, transport background and professionals, and uh, we are transport planners and engineers. See the transport system as a, a gender neutral system, um, but actually, in reality, that women have different travel patterns, different trip chance, and different preferences on transport modes. We think that uh, uh, big potentials to improve in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to say we've had one question in the chat box asking about a particular project um, um, in, in, in Bangladesh. So I think that's probably best um, dealt with in the CSO um, meeting, which is a bit later today, because the people on this panel here aren't, aren't, haven't been involved in that project. Um, now, for Eric, turning to you. Finally, um, what would be your vision for the AIB now? Well, so I, I could think, build on what was said by the other speakers. You know, for me, the dream is that we will have, you know, in projects have measurable components that really address what we have been talking about. And for that, you need data. You need to have, you know, PTLs who really care about this. And I think we have had a good example here. And we need, of course, to have also engagement on the policy side, because often uh, these things can only work if there is a sort of conducive policy environment where there are uh, real attention from policymakers to these issues. So, but, but in a very simple way, I think if we can get measurable components, that's going to get people excited about achieving things on the ground. And, and uh, we have heard a lot of examples, I think, from the uh, uh, Mumbai Metro that were things that could be part of, of such measurable components and, and having a, a baseline survey at the beginning, have a survey at the end and, and looking at really trying to learn as much and maybe actually also trying to learn as much during the implementation. And there, I think a lot of what we emphasized, you know, the inclusion of, of the users of transport can, can be very helpful to increase the learning. But the learning will always be enhanced if we have a, a serious a measurable, measurable components. I've seen it have impact in other MDBs, and I think this is this is the way we need we need to go. And we we know how to measure these things in this area. There's not all areas that that uh, you know we are pretty sure how we should measure things. Here is pretty straightforward, and, and and that's we should use that and 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 use the the excitement that you get out of seeing that you are actually having an impact on the ground. Yeah, I think what we all want is impact on the ground. And with that, I'm, we've reached, we've practically finished, uh, reached our time limit. So I'd really like to thank the panelists, Elena, Eric, Samantha, Weymin, Wensai, and Yana for participating. And um, I know it hasn't always been, it's been a learning curve for all of us to master the digital technology of this. Well, at least I speak for myself. So thank you very much for taking all the time and preparation before. Um, I'd like to thank um, my colleagues in OSD, and particularly Irish Bea Gila, and then my colleague in SCV, Inua Kong, because all their support behind the scenes, we would have never got the panel going. 
So thank you very much. And then I'd like to thank everybody who's joined us for having joined us and to let's hope and let's continue the discussion. And if you'd like to contact either me or any of our panelists, you can find our contact details on the AIB annual meeting website. So thank you very much, everybody.